like that. Sorry to interrupt you, but I'm sorry. I you were sorry when you started. <laughs> As I was saying, ladies and gentlemen, I, I bring you a man. Well, I could say he is America's favorite comedian. Why not? Well, Very tomorrow is Washington's birthday, and as a tribute to Washington's memory, I am going to tell the truth. What he is is a matter of opinion. Yeah, yeah. But here he is, Fred Allen in person. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And congratulations, Mr. Von Zell, in the breaking the habit of a lifetime. I appreciate the sentiment that moves you to tell the truth, Harry, but it seems to me that you might have chosen another time and another place. I might say. In fact, I shall say on second thought, <laughs> you might have chosen another time and place to start telling the truth. Oh, well, gosh, Fred, I th tomorrow's Washington's birthday. Well, I, I know, I, I know, Harry, but you could observe it some other way than belittling me. Well, you I... could get a hatchet and chop down a commercial. <laughs> <laughs> you could throw Van Steeden across the Potomac. You yeah. could observe well, it. Well, what's the use? New Jersey would only throw him right back. <laughs> That's right, too. And the air is bad enough without Van Steeden in it. <laughs> Truth is all right in its place, Harry. But do you know what would really happen if everyone on radio started to tell the truth? You'd be back working in the Boston Public Library, Alan. <laughs> and, uh... Well, you told me to wait. I waited. <laughs> and you'd be... He's got one line in the whole show, and he wants you to wait for his laugh. <laughs> Yes, sir, and you'd be... <laughs> now, uh, the, all you'll hear from him from now on is his arm goes up. That's all. <laughs> uh, you'd be back, Van Steeden. You'd be back pounding a piano in that brow house. Yes, and I, I'd be the only one left on the program. Yes, and before someone tells the truth and you're out of a job, too, Harry, we turn to the latest news of the week. See, that was Van Steeden. You didn't hear him, but there he was. <laughs> Ipana News presents... The World in Review. New York City, New York. Mother Nature sends eastern states a cosmic valentine in form of winter's worst blizzard. Heavy snow accompanied by sub-freezing temperatures and icy gales tie up highways, slows trains, impedes city traffic, and brings chills and spills to millions. Ipana News checks up on effects of last week's storm by quizzing the man in the sleet. <laughs> First, a little-known official in the New York street cleaning department, Mr. Tinker Dawdle. Now, Mr. Dawdle, is the snow situation under control? And eh, nothing's under control, brother. What's the trouble? Eh, the city's short of dough. Well, I know, but... Hasn't the mayor done anything about removing the snow? He called the Board of Estimate into his office yesterday. To pass an appropriation? To pray for rain. It's cheap. <laughs> but surely, surely the city has allotted the street cleaning department some money, Mr. Dawson. Yeah, it ain't money. It's chicken feed, brother. The snow appropriation is 12 bucks. 12 bucks? Well, what can you do with 12 dollars? Well, that's it. I got two men out. Only two men clearing the snow in New York City. Yeah. I got a guy with a whisk broom brushing off Park Avenue. <laughs> and the, um, the other man removing the snow? He's a guy with big feet. He's stamping it down in the Bronx. <laughs> well, do you, do, you, uh, do you think New York will ever be able to get rid of the snow without any money? There's only one solution, brother. Now, what is that? Get the Democrats and Republicans to open their conventions in New York right away. Well, how would that help? Well, with all that hot air, brother. I, I see what you mean, and Say, uh, confidentially, you think Jim Farley will be in a presidential race? Well, I imagine he will. Why? It's going to be the first time anybody caught a mailman running. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Tinker Doddle. A mounted, uh, a mounted policeman who had... Uh, oh, I wish you'd come on your horse. I can barely see you. A mounted... You guys aren't so big when you get down off of those uh, quadrupeds, are you? A mounted policeman who had an unusual experience in the blinding snowstorm was Officer Cornwall Straddle. 
What happened, uh, Officer Straddle? Well, I ride out of the stable Wednesday as usual. I'm feeling tip-top. Ready for traffic, huh? Rare in the go. I'm riding up 6th Avenue side saddle. <laughs> A mounted policeman side saddle? Well, you were kidding, of course. Yeah, hand in the cab driver's a lift, uh, you know uh, me. Uh, <laughs> well, I gallop up to 57th Street. I'm yelling, hi, O Silver, and... Pressing me horse to a hurdy good. Oh, boy. Everything's under control, huh? Yeah, traffic's running smooth. I'm backing me horse in the windshields. He makes his tail go like a wiper. I'm having a lot of fun. Oh, I can... <laughs> I can imagine. Well, all of a sudden, it started. The snow? I could have been in Florida. We're that bad, huh? Yeah. The snow's coming down so thick, I can't even see in between the flakes. I'm sitting there on me horse. It must have been terrible. It's brutal. I feel like a hair sticking up in a shower of dandruff. <laughs> the snow kept coming down? At two o'clock, the snow is up to me horse's with us. Yes? At three o'clock, it's up to mine. <laughs> Up to your withers, eh? And this, uh, this kept up all afternoon? By five o'clock, I'm under the snow. Only me eyes are sticking up. I'm just getting ready to quit. Yes? I see a lump coming under the snow. The lump pulls over to the curb. And? It's a car. The guy's parking next to a hike. The lump. Yeah. Well, what did you do? I gets down off of me horse. I'm in eight feet of snow. I burrow me way through and give the guy a ticket. Well, did you find your way back? Well, I come burrowing back, feeling me way to the horse. Uh-huh. I can't find the stirrup, but I jumps up on top. Yes? All but me head is still under the snow. I yell, gee, gee, up, and I'm off. On your way back to the station. Yeah, I come to 59th Street, me horse won't turn. I'm yelling, whoa, Malcolm, nothing doing. <laughs> I shoot up Central Park West. With your head sticking out of the snow? Yeah, I'm yelling, whoa, I'm still going. Through Yonkers, through Mount Vernon, I come to Stamford, bang, I stops. Your horse must have been exhausted. What horse? You mean, you mean that in that snow you hadn't gotten back on your horse? No, I mounted the Boston bus. <laughs> You're the first jockey that's ever been on a greyhound. And thank you, Officer Straddle. A downtown housewife who enjoyed a freak adventure in the heavy snowstorm was Mrs. Maxine Messbaum. You had an unusual experience, Mrs. Messbaum. What is happening to me could be by Disney. <laughs> it was so funny, you mean? Funny, but with complications. What, uh, what happened? Well, where I am living is a ground floor. Upstairs, it's a tenement. I see. <laughs> All day long, my husband, Neville, is a very working. Neville Messbaum? Yeah. <laughs> Your, uh, your husband was named after the great statesman? No, it's a street in Brooklyn. Oh. <laughs> now, about, uh, about the snowstorm. Well, as previously I'm stating, I'm living on the ground floor. Must be convenient. It's also handy. <laughs> when I'm going by the A&P, always I'm stepping out the window and I'm all right on the street. You never use the door? Always the window. Oh. <laughs> Coming back from the A&P, I am again stepping in the window and zip, I am home. And on the day of the storm? I am stepping out the window and going to a movie. And while you were in the theater, of course, it started snowing. And when I'm coming out, the streets is mountains. Snow is overall. What did you do? I am climbing on the snow, giving a yodel. And starting for home? Well, first I'm stopping by Irving the Delicatessen and buying cold cuts. <laughs> On Wednesdays, Neville is liking cold cuts. A gourmet. Every time. <laughs> well, after, after buying the cold cuts, did you come right home? Lick at the spittle. Lick at the spittle. <laughs> I am walking down the street on top of the snow, stepping in the window. I am home. And then? I am fixing up the cold cuts and sitting down to wait for Neville. Then it is happening. What? A man is stepping in the window. I am coming from behind and kissing him. 
He is turning around. And? It is not Neville. Not ne- You mean that you were in the wrong apartment? The snow is so deep, I am stepping in a window three flights off. <laughs> Well, uh, what happened? Well, luckily, the stranger is liking cold cuts. <laughs> so we are eating dinner. Naturally. Well, what, what became of Neville? Who knows? Next week, I am no longer Mrs. Neville Mesbaum. No. I am Mrs. Pierpont Weintraub, M.D. <laughs> M.D., a doctor, huh? No, a millinery designer. <laughs> From now on, my hats, I'm getting wholesale. Congratulations, <laughs> Mrs. Pierpont Weintraub, on your Snow White adventure. And now, a, uh, a man who really, honestly, I might say, welcomed the snow was poet Thorndike Swinburne. Your name sounds familiar, Thorndike. Weren't you here a couple of weeks ago? Didn't you recite some poem about the cold? Yes. Uh, when zero is below, below, the world is decked in ice and snow. I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. I... <laughs> you crumbed up this program about four weeks ago. So I did, and, and you threw me out the 49th Street door. So I did. Before I recite tonight, may I ask a favor? What? Will you throw me out the 15th Street door? I'm going up town. <laughs> it can be arranged, I'm sure. Thank you. Now, this poem tonight you have, is it dedicated to the recent snowstorm? Yes. It's called Snow is Snow. A catchy title, <laughs> albeit redundant. We'll go right ahead. Snow is snow, where'll you go? Pile it high. Pile it low, still it snow. So it is. Snow is snow, when it's in a ball, when it's in the street, when it's in the hall, still it snow. Yes. Snow is snow, though it seems a blanket, when it's in your motor as you try to crank it. Lump it, dump it, stack it, bank it, still it snow. <laughs> You've got a one-track mind, that's all I can say. That is the end, I hope. Yes, you may throw me out now. It will be a pleasure. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, The 50th Street door, I'm going up tall. We'll throw you up now. Let's get you started off right. And thank you, Thorndike Swinburne. And while the East was in the grip of the snow and sleet, California, too, had its share of trouble. Out of Hollywood came the biggest frost of the year. The Hollywood Frost. Hello again. This is... Now, and now, ladies and gentlemen, the Merry Max sit down at their song Ouija board to try to bring back for us an old friend, Ragtime Cowboy Joe. may surprise you, ladies and gentlemen, but more than $2 million is going to be given away in prize contests this year alone. And to help you get your share of the prizes, we're going to drop a ha- handful of hints that may come in handy. Now, these hints will be dropped personally by that old booby contest winner, Herschel von Z. Well, ladies and gentlemen, before you enter any contest, read the rules carefully. And in writing your entry, you should make it simple and personal if possible... But above everything else, you should be sincere. Well, how about a for instance, Harry? Well, all right, Fred. For instance, uh, suppose you had to write a short statement on why you like... uh, Well, what should we say, why you like... Oh, that's uh, a sticker, Harry. Now, let mm. me see. Now, why why not say Sal Hepatica, Harry? Yes, well, that's fair enough. Why you like Sal Hepatica. Well, now, first, you should tell how it helped you in some specific way. Like this. Whenever I feel a cold coming on, I always take Sal Hepatica. Thank you. Pietro Van Pancho and his Hacienda Hillbillies have just played Say C.C. And now we turn from questionable melody to our guest. She's a cute little girl with flax and curls. Thank you, oh, Mr. Allen. Oh, no, no, not you, Portland. I was talking about our guest. 
Oh, well... Oh, wait a minute. No ad-libbing. You keep those O's out of there. Just say what it says. Well, your guest isn't here yet. If you want to kill time, you can talk to me. That's a nasty weapon to pull on time. <laughs> but uh, my credit isn't that good. I don't think to pull a weapon on time. But tell me, what's... Uh, we'll wait around. I mean, if anything... <laughs> Anything cooking, just let us know. But <laughs> tell me, what's new, Portland? Nothing much. Uh, Mama and I went to the dog show. You didn't uh, win any prizes, did you? <laughs> if... <laughs> See, when you're mugging, you turn all the way around. A mug is wasted over there. If that was supposed to be funny, I'm not laughing. Yeah, you uh, you joined the uh, great majority, huh? Uh, what kind of... Uh, that's not the thing. Well, what kind of... Uh, just noticed it's the wrong line. <laughs> what difference when you haven't got a laugh, you just read anything. What's coming up now? What... Uh, what... <laughs> what... Uh, <laughs> What kind of dogs did you see at the show, Portland? We saw some setters, bloodhounds, bagels. I know. Up, 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 up. Wait a minute. What is that bagels? A bagel isn't a dog. A bagel is a delicatessen halo. <laughs> it's a uh, solid nimbus that occasionally rises over a steaming hot, co hot cup of coffee in the hand of a customer. It's not a bagel. The dog is a beagle, Port. Yes, a bagel. Well, that cleans... Don't mix me up in it. Just <laughs> That cleans that. You say you saw some bloodhounds over there, too? Yes. We saw one bloodhound that sure had imagination. How could you tell? <laughs> he made a big fuss over Mama, and Mama's anemic. Say, you know... <laughs> You know, I bet, I bet that's the same bloodhound that bit Benny one year on speculation. <laughs> did you, uh, did you see any dachshunds over there? You mean those little dogs with the sunken chassis? Uh-huh. Their stomachs hang down like skin snoods. <laughs> Are those dachshunds? Oh, yes, yes. They're built so low when you feed them, you have to bury their food so they can get at it. If you ever buy a dachshund, be sure and ask for the shovel that goes with it. Well, I certainly will. Say, tell me, did you see any English bulls at the show? Those dogs with the Ubangi lips? Yeah. We saw lots of those. Well, you have to be careful with those English bulls. It's the... <laughs> what are you laughing at? I'm not even into the thing here yet. <laughs> it's not that good. I heard at the other show and nothing happened. <laughs> sure, an English bull, you have to be very careful. Its lower jaw sticks out so far. If you leave it out in the rain, it's apt to ship water and drown. <laughs> well, so much for putting... I never knew a dog could lay an egg until... <laughs> so much for putting on the dog. Now, what about our guest? Tonight, you're going to meet a little girl, a star of tomorrow. Oh, boy. Is she previewing tonight for 1960? What does she do? She's the youngest xylophone virtuoso in the world. Really? Yes. Mr. Allen, meet Miss Barbara Del Rose. Well, good evening, Barbara. Good evening. Hello, Mr. Allen. Oh, excuse me. I didn't mean to step on your greeting. How is your itsy-bitsy-babsy this great big beautiful evening? If you're talking baby talk for me, Mr. Allen, you can dispense with it. Uh. <laughs> that kid's been monkeying with the dialogue. It's going to be... <laughs> Well, I'm sorry, Barbara. <laughs> I'm sorry, Barbara. You're so little I didn't know. I stopped baby talk years ago. You did? Well, how old are you, Barbara? I'm six and a half. Only six and a half. Well, Portland tells me that you are an expert on the xylophone. I don't know if I'm an expert, Mr. Allen, but Mama says I'm good. That's good enough for me. <laughs> when a mother says that her little girl has talent, I'm... <laughs> When did you, uh, when did you start playing the xylophone, Babs? When I was four years old. Well, how can you ever reach up to beat those splinters? You look like a fugitive from Edgar Bergen's knee. 
No, I can play all right. Well, tell me, of all the instruments in the band, why did you ever choose the xylophone as an outlet for your musical talents? That's kind of a long story, Mr. Allen. Well, I sat through Gone with the Wind. <laughs> Shall we carry on? I think Mama can tell it better than I can. Oh, you're just saying that. You know you can do it justice. <laughs> Where is your mother? Right there. Ah, oh, excuse me, Mrs. Delrose, and good evening. Hello, Mr. Allen. Well, tell me, did, uh, did Barbara... <laughs> Uncle Jim was handling this script. You know, we could have put a stand in here and saved all this wear and tear on Uncle Jim. <laughs> Your trust to me turns over eight pages at a time. You'll wind up in a sketch yet if he doesn't... <laughs> Tell me... <laughs> no whispering. They hear it in California. Tell me, did you... Uh, how did Barbara come to take up the xylophone? Well, my sister used to play, and she gave me an old xylophone she had discarded. She did. Well, I often wondered what people did with their old xylophone. <laughs> now it comes out, they give them to relatives. Well, did Barbara make any progress spanking the slats? Yes. She... She picked it up so quickly and liked the instrument so well, I took her to a teacher, and she's been playing ever since. Well, has Barbara appeared professionally before? Yes. She's played at several clubs and private shows. Well, are you planning a musical career for Bar Barbara when she grows up? Yes, I am. Well, isn't that nice? In years to come, you can sit back in Carnegie Hall, look up on the stage, and there will be Barbara playing with old Phil Spitalny. <laughs> What do you think about it, Barbara? About what, Mr. Allen? I, Barbara Del Rose, you dozed off while your mother and I were trying to earn an honest dollar here at the microphone. <laughs> no, Mr. Allen, I'm wide right awake. Well, I guess you're anxious to play your solo and get back to your homework. I hope you don't let your music interfere with school, Barbara. Oh, no, I get very good marks. I've skipped twice. Fine. You know, when I was a little boy, the only way they could get me from one class into another was to extradite me. <laughs> Explain it to the child later, Jim. Do you, uh, do you play any other instrument? <laughs> Have her explain some of her lines to me, too. <laughs> do you, uh, do you play any other... Uh... How are we doing, Bev? <laughs> Very good. Uh, do you, uh, do you play any other instrument besides the xylophone? Not yet, but I'm going to start studying the piano soon. Well, that's good. It's always nice to have a sideline, Barbara. <laughs> you know, the xylophone is a risky business when you get a little older. I read about a concert xylophonist who gave a recital out in Hollywood. It seems he broke his glasses and couldn't see his instrument, and before they could stop him, he had played half of Liebestraum on the ribs of one of Bing Crosby's horses. <laughs> The horse ran a race that afternoon. The xylophonist came in second and paid seven twenty for play. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm <laughs> fiscal Pete beat him out. Is that, but I'm boring you, Papa. <laughs> what are you going to play for us now? The overture to Poet and Peasant. Oh, well, that's pretty long, Barbara. Just give us a digest version. You just play the poet, and we'll play peasant some other night. <laughs> another bow, Barbara. Oh, it's Wynn Murray. <laughs> do, do I need glasses? <laughs> and now, oh, you're not mad, are you, Wynn? Huh? 
mad? No, I'm not mad. Oh, that's swell. Just let it accumulate and get good in there somewhere. <laughs> Miss Lynn Murray, our little vocal pixie, uh, prances out of the dell to sing for us Cheery Berry Bee. From the daily reports that my talent scouts bring in, I gather... How do you get out of this place? How do you get out of this Not so loud. We're on the air, I think. All right. You're on the air. But where am I? I turn my head for one minute and zippo. They're gone. The whole bunch of them. Guide and all. (laughs) You were a member of a party being guided through the studios on a 55-cent tour? Well, I wasn't exactly a member. Not in good standing, I wasn't... That is, I was a sort of a stowaway. Oh, I, and I, I think I, I do. I think uh, don't twist yourself out of shape. But now that you are, now that you are in uh, are here, why not just sit down and try to enjoy the show, brother? Oh, not me. I I want to get home because I'm getting a call in the head and. Hanging around here won't do me any good. Well, I think you're mistaken about that. Now, and if you'll just hang around here for about two shakes of a sentence, we can prove it to you, can't we, Harry? Yes, I'm sure we can, Fred. Because if you learn to get after a cold at its very beginning by putting two teaspoonfuls of sal hepatica in a glass of water and drinking it, then you've learned something that will do you a world of good. Because sparkling sal hepatica helps fight colds faster. There are two very good reasons why it does, ladies and gentlemen, which you can check with your own doctor. First, sal hepatica is speedy, yet it's very gentle. And speed is mighty important in fighting a cold. Second, and just as important, this famous saline laxative also helps nature counteract the acidity that so frequently accompanies a cold. Remember, in a recent survey, it was found that seven out of ten doctors recommend a saline laxative in treating a cold. And sal hepatica, we believe, is America's outstanding saline laxative. So, for faster action against colds, go to any drugstore and get a bottle of gentle, quick-acting Sal Hepatica. This is Mr. and Mrs. Average Man's Round Table where three persons selected from our studio audience are invited to give their opinions on a question that concerns some prominent issue of the day. These little sessions are entirely unrehearsed. Fred is taking his place now at the round table, where he meets his fellow debaters for the first time. Are you ready, Fred? Yes, I am, Harry. If Forbin will kindly introduce our first guest this evening. Yes, Mr. Hewitt H. Thomas from New York City. Oh, good evening, Mr. Thomas. Good evening, Fred. May I uh, uh, make so bold as to ask your profession, business, or calling? I'm a music copyist. A music copyist? Yes, sir. Well, what, uh, what is the function of a music copyist? I may be a little dumb, but all I ever see is musicians' backs. I don't know what they're doing. They seem to be... You copy parts for each of the in, uh, each of the instruments from a score. Oh, the uh, the copyist copies the separate parts that later show up here in a played off key by members who are under contract to <laughs> Mr. Van Steen. But I, uh, do you think that modern music will last, Mr. Thomas? The numbers, the type of music that we're getting today, the popular variety. I think so. You do think it will last? You don't say for how long, though. <laughs> you wouldn't care to be quoted. No, sir. Well, why is it, then, if, uh, if, uh, if this present music will last, why are we having revivals of old oh, Johnny, old oh, Johnny, and those songs that can't be more than eight or ten years old? Why are they coming back so fast, do you know? Well, they're brought back in the style we play numbers today. Oh, I see. Just the old numbers come back in another style. Wolf in sheep's clothing, Chopin's clothing, huh? <laughs> well, thank you a lot, Mr. I was wondering where songwriters, composers get their inspirations for those crazy numbers, chop, 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 excavate, 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 that <laughs> English version. And I saw, I think I've traced the thing now, I saw a songwriter over in Lindy's this afternoon. He was copying down the caraway seeds on a roll over there. <laughs> I think, I think he's got a hit. 
Meantime, he was eating the roll, to be sure. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. And now, Portland. Miss Rita Walker from New York City. Good evening, Miss Walker. Good evening, Mr. Allen. Do you work here in New York, may I ask? Yes, I do, Mr. Allen. In what capacity? May I further? Encourage? I'm a hostess. A hostess? In a gypsy tea kettle. A hostess in a gypsy tea kettle? <laughs> Is there a room in the uh, kettle for a hostess with the bag and the hot water? <laughs> hostess. Oh, now, let us re control ourselves, Miss Walker, if we can. I know it's hard when we're confronted by one of America's foremost comedians. <laughs> as they say, two, two men said it today and were rushed away for observation. <laughs> but tell me, uh, in those tea shops, I know the, the food and fortune telling seems to be the vogue in most of the gypsy tea shops. Tell me, do many men go in those places to have their fortunes told? Well, sometimes. They don't like to admit it. They send it kind of foolish, but they like to go in there. They though. sneak in. Huh? <laughs> sneak in, yeah. For the oolong in the future, huh? Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, well, I know, of course, some of the uh, the uh, wealthier men don't have to. The newspapers are telling their fortunes for them once a year. They don't have to bother with the tea shops. I noticed in the list this year, some soap men seem to have made the most money for 1938 or 9. I guess Sally... Rand using so many bubbles during the year, it runs into soap, and naturally they profit through it. I don't know. How, tell me, how is it possible to tell a person's fortune through scanning the, the, uh, the grouping of, of a lot of irrelevant dank tea leaves? How is it possible? Well, you see, all the tea leaves get in a huddle, and then yeah. we separate them. Oh, man's destiny is controlled by a lot of wet leaves. Eh? Yeah. Well, he may as well have a go at it. Everybody else has. Well, thank you a lot, uh, Miss Walker. I had a joke I was going to tell, but it slipped my mind. I had bacon for dinner. Things are slipping my mind. Uh, now, the Portland. Mister, Maya, please. Mr. Peter Russo from Fairfield, Connecticut. Uh, good evening, Mr. Russo. Good evening, Fred. You look to me like a professional wrestler, are you? No. <laughs> Fred, I'm, I'm vice president of the Kitchen Bouquet Company. You know, Kitchen Bouquet. You're vice president of the Kitchen Bouquet, the uh, Kitchen Bouquet Company. Yes. You're not sneaking in a commercial here by any means. By no means. So what? Uh, what is Kitchen Bouquet? I've heard of it. Well, some people think that Kitchen Bouquet is a bunch of flowers that you keep in the kitchen, but of course it isn't. No. Kitchen Bouquet is si savory seasoning sauce used to give flavor and enrich the color of gravy. Uh huh. I don't think we've had it. Portland cooks. Uh, yes, you have had it. We have had uh, it. Mr. Allen, uh, Mrs. Allen told me before I came in here tonight that she often uses it in the lamb stew that she serves you and which you oh. like so much. <laughs> well, I tell you, the first lamb stew Portland made, I didn't taste. We, uh, we put it in the goldfish's bowl and the grotto disappeared. <laughs> A grotto can't take it. I wouldn't. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Russo, and good luck uh, to your kitchen bouquet enterprise. Well, we seem, through some strange prank of uh, verbal uh, romping here, to have come uh, to our question. Now, many discussions have been held in the past about the traditional vanity of woman. Tonight, uh, we prance verbally in new pastures and take up the vanity of man. And not under the head of vanity, but over the head of man, we find the toupee. Now, our question tonight is, do you think that when a man is losing his hair, or has lost all of his hair, he should wear a toupee? Now, Mr. Thomas, how do you feel about the toupee? I think it'd be a matter of choice. A matter of choice. You think if a man feels as though he should wear a toupee, he should? Yes, sir. Do you think actors should wear them to uh, conceal their... Uh, Bald nubs from their <laughs> loving public. I think we should. If it would enhance their beauty. All right, thank you, Mr. Thomas. And now, Miss Walker, how do, what do you think about the toupee? Well, of course, all men look like little babies when they're bald-headed, you know. When they're bald-headed? <laughs> well, would you, uh, would you marry a man with a brow doily? <laughs> Well, 
Do you think, uh, all we want to know, yes or no, do you think a man should wear a uh, stoop to cranial deceit? <laughs> yes Well, or no? if it looks good on him, yes. He should. All yeah. right, now we've got one and one. Mr. Russo, how do you feel about the frown bib? I'm against toupees. You are against two pegs. <laughs> yes. All right. That's two against and one for. Uh, one for. I'd like to go into it. Uh, do you think that if uh, if people were, were able to get a bottle of kitchen bouquet with a toupee, that the toupee would be uh, permissible in the better circles? It might be that. you think a man would look better with a bottle of kitchen bouquet on his head than he would with a toupee? <laughs> if you could pop the kitchen bouquet in the middle? Well, that seems to be two to one against the toupee. And I don't imagine that our attitude towards the toupee, or hair beret, as it's sometimes so lovingly called, will have any great effect on the future of the skull and to Macassar. I am sure that folks with hair will... No one is old enough but Uncle Jim to know what an antimacassar is. <laughs> I am sure that folks with hair will continue to use Vitalis, and men without hair will continue to use their own judgment. Our, on this note of confusion, our forum is adjourned, and thank you greatly for your kind participation. <laughs> And now, ladies and gentlemen, a mighty welcome guest, Miss Anderson, who will favor the microphone with a carefully considered statement. Thank you, Mr. Allen. When right certainly is, Elvon Harry, brighter me give helps paste tooth Ipana that says he smile attractive more and the teeth. Well, perhaps it's the echo that confuses me, Miss Anderson, but frankly, I don't get it. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Really... Allen. Well, you see, I was just repeating an impression I received while looking in the mirror last night. Oh, and now I get it. And you said it the way it would look in a mirror, backwards. That's right. But frontwards, it goes like this. Harry Von Zell is certainly right when he says that I pan a toothpaste helps give you brighter teeth. And... Players, ladies and gentlemen, tonight they present another dripping one long pan mystery. This case is dramatized from a few notes found on the back of an old laundry bundle. It is called The Missing Cat. The time, the present. The scene, the rumpus room in the Van Drone mansion. Mrs. Dr Van Drone rings for her butler. You rang, Mrs. Van Drone? Yes, Hillpot. What news of Persian lady? Dr. Fink is still with her, Mum. He's trying to get the cat to say, ah. Oh. Did Persian lady eat her lunch? She barely touched her caviar ragu. And how about her filet of tom tit? She just sniffed it and turned away. Did she lap up her demi tasse of champagne? Not a lap, Mum. I served our best vintage, Chateau Lefkowitz, 29. <laughs> oh, I do hope Dr. Fink finds the cause of her trouble. Have you entered Persian Lady for the $50,000 prize at the cat show, ma'am? Yes, and if she doesn't win, Hillpot, I shall have to close the townhouse and join the nouveau poor. Oh, Dr. Fink, yes. have you... Yes, I have completed my diagnosis, Mrs. Van Drone. And what did you find? Uh, may I speak to you in private? Yes, Dr. Fink. Hillpot, go to Persian Lady and comfort her. Very well, madam. And now, Dr. Fink, what is wrong with my prize Maltese? Persian lady is a whirlpool of inhibitions. She is a victim of faulty diet, rich food. She is suffering from mousophobia. Mousophobia? Exactly. The medical term for rodent deficiency. <laughs> that cat should be fed a mouse at once. A mouse? Yes. Even if it's only a Mickey. <laughs> Mrs. Van Drone, oh, Mrs. Van Drone. What is it, Hillpot? Persian lady's gone. Dead? No, disappeared. There's a hole in the window. Catnapped. Good heavens. I'm calling the police. Hello, operator. Get me police headquarters. Word of the missing cat is flashed from coast to coast. It is picked up by that oriental Dick Tracy, one long pen. Long pen jumps into his police car through the streets of Chinatown, his siren screaming... Long Pen speeds to the scene of the crime. Taking the front stairs one at a time, Long Pen is at the door. He knocks. Come in. Ah, greeting, gay. Glass Schumer, gay. Who are you? I am Detective One Long Pen, Chinese gangbuster. Nya, 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 said I, J. Fox. <laughs> Good heavens, a Chinese Merrimack. Long pan, long pan, not Merrimack. Guess who? Hiya, students, yes, there, yes, there, yes, go, students. Guess who? Guess who? Oh, here, hold my stethoscope, Mrs. Van Drone. I'll throw this yellow peril out. 
not throw out peril, roll out peril. Roll out the peril, we have a peril. <laughs> now see here, you oriental jitterbug. Long pan, not the fritterbug. Long pan ace detective. What, uh, what, uh, confidentially, what, uh, what is crime? My prize cat, Persian lady, has disappeared. Persian lady disappear? Catastrophe. Yes. Mrs. Van Drone was counting on Persian lady to win the $50,000 prize at the cat show tomorrow. And, uh, who are you, Mr. Huffenpuff? I am Dr. Orestes Fink, the famous animal doctor. Dr. Fink is here to treat my cat. Yes. Who, who else here when cat to disappear, Mr. Van Drone? Just Dr. Fink, myself, and Hillpart the butler. And final triangle... Long pan catch on, difficult case. Do you think some thief has stolen my cat, Mr. Long pan? No thief take your cat, lady. Your push scare any thief twenty paces. <laughs> oh, 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 some funny joke. Oh, long pan hot tonight. Oh, long pan, long pan so hot. Fire engine, fire engine, come. Come in. Well, where's the fire? Quick, where is the fire? Who are you, Mr. Fire Helmet? I'm Mayor LaGuardia. Isn't there a fire here? <laughs> There's no fire here. There's a cat napping. Oh, shoot. The wrong house. So long, folks. Uh, uh, don't waste your water. <laughs> Good old Fialello. Little man who all the time there. Yes. Yes, they say the mayor will ride 20 miles to see a hot foot. <laughs> I hate to appear inquisitive, gentlemen, but are we getting anywhere? You bet. Long pan whip into action. Long pan concentrate. Long pan sing did they catch some clothes. Yes. Shout out the border. The landlady stands. Well, uh, when border reach for second piece of meat, get the knife in hand. Oh. <laughs> Will you stop that, John Charles Fu Young? <laughs> If you're a detective, I am Pinocchio. I am detective, lady. Then I am Pinocchio. Well, who does that make me? Maybe Osha Wells. <laughs> uh, I remain obediently yours. You, you stop Orson round. <laughs> Long pan, go into action. Maybe Persian lady hide. Maybe cat hide. Pay uh, uh, push in the corner, maybe. Long pan, examine loom. Ah, you see closet. Long pan, open closet door. <laughs> China man in closet. Who are you, sinister one? I am Confucius. <laughs> what do uh, you know about missing cat, Confucius? Confucius say, best way to discover missing cat, start poker game, sure to find kitty. <laughs> Good heavens, who was that? Oh, no, maybe part air condition, maybe coolie system. <laughs> Long pan, open other door. Holy smoke! A second Chinaman. Who are you, big boy? I am Confucius. What you do in second closet, Confucius? Confucius say, man hide in closet in suit. Man hide in bureau in drawers. <laughs> oh, sure. Pokey, pokey. Confucius need no lighter, no lighter. Long pan, open next closet. Polish, more. Another Chinaman. Who are you, buddy? I am Confucius. Again, again Confucius, again Confucius. Long pan open three closets, Confucius, every closet. Yes, Confucius say, that's me all over. <laughs> Confucius, crazy, crazy Confucius. Confucius, every class are very confusing. Yes, yes. Uh, well, I've got to get back to my clinic. I'm doing a tonsillectomy on the leopard at three. Nobody leaves this house. Long pan, girl, everybody. Where, where's the felt pot? Where's, where's the butler? I'll butler? ring for him. He'll be right here. You ring, Mom? You a bird line. You come clean, Mr. Sideburn. You pill for pussy. No. You lie, Flunky. You kill cat. You sell fur. You fess up. No, 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 I'm innocent. You... This is ridiculous. I'll vouch for Hillpart. Who will vouch for you? I'll vouch for Mrs. Vendrone. And who will vouch for you? I'll vouch for Dr. Fink. And who will vouch for Long Pan? Can you just say, Boulevard vouch for Long Pan? It is now Boulevard vouch time. <laughs> Oh, for heaven's sakes, will you get on with this mystery? And how get on? Long pan, go to town. It's about time. Now you come, you come clean. You tell, you tell Long pan when cat disappear. Right after Dr. Fink examined her. What, uh, all the same wrong with Kitty? The Persian lady is suffering from rodent deficiency. Mousophobia. Mousophobia. Yes, yes, exactly. Mrs. Van Drone refused to feed her mice. 
Or tenement meat, as mice are sometimes called. Okay, Porky, okay, Porky. Long pen, now go to see the climb. Persian Lady Sweet is right next door. Is it here? This way, please. Oh, some snappy, some snappy stuff, some snappy stuff. Platinum saucer. Oh, oh, gold bed. What is piece of silk compared to Miss Van Dome? The cat's pajamas. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you make funny fat touch. Oh, you bad touch. Long pan take candor. Yes, you see that? There is the hole in the window. Long pan examine hole. Broken glass, you say, not on floor. Hole cut inside. Glass pushed out. But how was the hole cut? Aha! Window glass cut by diamond here. Who left diamond? I did. It's only an old dirty diamond. Persian lady liked to play with it. Exactly. Oh, dirty diamond. Cat cut hole in window with old dirty diamond. Call out. Smart cat. Yes, yes. Persian lady's feeling IQ was 97. Uh, Mousophobia was her only weakness. Oh, you see, feeling IQ, he said. Uh, who left open newspaper on floor? It's the New York Times. Persian lady liked to glance through it every morning. Long, long pan examine open page. Ah, oh, ladies and gentlemen, Miss Rissau. What? what? Then where is Persian lady? Persian lady be back home here exactly two seconds. One, two. You see, long pan right on time every time. Come in. Uh, Mrs. Van Drone, is this your cat here? Persian lady. Oh, thank heaven you're back, darling. Down, dear, down. Who brought Mother's pet home? Uh, I'm the doorman at the Roxy, lady. Your cat sneaked past me into the theater. She climbed up on the stage and was jumping at the screen. We finally subdued her, and here she is. Extraordinary. And you knew where she was, Long Pan. Exactly. Dr. Fink say cats suffer massophobia. Star for mice. Newspaper ad give clue. But why should Persian lady go to the Roxy Theater for mice? Long Pan tell you why. What picture you show at a uh, Loxy Dome, man? Of mice and men. Oh. Of mice and men, exactly. <laughs> Mystery song. You're a genius, Long Pen. Oh, you bet, you bet. Next week, Long Pen on information, please. <laughs> Long Pen, China, Johnny Kieran. <laughs> Go to sweep, America. <laughs> Thank you very much, Peter. Well, ladies and gentlemen, not so long ago, we passed along to you a bit of very gratifying information that came to us entirely unsolicited. Information concerning a recent survey among dentists, in which it was found that more dentists personally use iPana toothpaste than any other dentifrice of any type. Now, there's a very close parallel between that and the public's choice. For so many of you have chosen iPana as your personal dentifrice, that iPana has become the largest selling toothpaste in America today. The reason for such high public and professional regard can be summed up in the two following short sentences.